Coming up on Wild Talk, Kate Rundle brings us some cool and funny fishing clips. We hear from Kyle, the host of Greenway Outdoors. So we wanted to create content for people that are outside of the hunting industry that are younger. Megan Evans with the Alberta Invasive Species Council to talk about problematic fish in our waters. And we speak with Ron Fipke to talk about the Angler and Young Angler Alberta organization and tournaments. AYA, you get what you put in, right? So if you put in a lot of hard work, uh, you get good, great results. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gores. The Wild TV Canada app. And these fine sponsors. Welcome to this week's episode of Wild Talk. I'm Scott Sterling, your host, and I'm joined today by none other than Kyle Green from the Greenway Outdoors. Kyle, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Nice to see you. So... I hear you got some big things cooking, but let's talk about uh, the Greenway Outdoors. You've been with Wild since you started the show seven years ago, I think it is? That's right, yeah. And uh, the mission then is the same as the mission now, is 60% of hunting and fishing licenses are sold to white males over the age of 55. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that's what pays for our species sustainability efforts, that's what pays for our... Uh, national parks, that's what pays for our clean water, that's what pays for our forests, that's what protects our ecosystems, that's how we have fish stocking, all those things come from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses as well as hunting and fishing equipment. And seven years ago when we started with you guys, we, we analyzed and saw in the marketplace that a lot of the content kind of was leaning towards that kill shot show, lower mm -hmm. production type content. Um, and actually uh, the show that you helped with and were on that one was one of the ones that I actually really liked and um, your guys' production quality was super high and I always had a lot of admiration for you guys and also Meat Eater. Um, I thought those two shows both are really high productions. But other than that, as far as reaching people outside of the industry, those kill shot shows and lower production wasn't interesting the Millennials and Generation Z. So we wanted to create mm -hmm. a show that would hit that market and the way we did it was we had a show broken up into five parts. And every episode's about a specific tactic for a specific species being hunting or fishing. So we might be, you know, hunting pythons in the Everglades, hunting buffalo in Oklahoma. We might be fishing for trout in northern Michigan. We could be anywhere, anywhere in the world doing anything. But we mm -hmm. would cover the conservation of the species. We would cover the gear needed for it. We would show you the hunting or fishing trip in a reality show style format. And then we would also have a, a segment where we taught you a lesson that included a right. Bible verse. And then mm -hmm. we had our studio kitchen where we showed you how to cook it. Focusing on the higher production quality as well as the cooking content and the reality content because that's what's popular with that age group. So we wanted to create content for people that are outside of the hunting industry that are younger because that's the future that we need to bring into the industry. So that's kind of a background on who we are and why we do what we do every day. No, you're 100% right. And, uh, you know, I've followed your show obviously since the, since the beginning and, it's it's gotten nothing but better over time so well because you guys are are i mean still how old are you kyle now uh we're we're all our youngest guy on the team is 21 and the oldest guy is 33 and we're everywhere in between there so yeah, it's you a young are, the whole you guys are all, young. you guys are all still wet behind the ears i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, we have a young team and you look at it the team that's been with me is the same team since day one so Ryan was only like 15 or 16 when he started working with us. So it's kind of funny. I can tell you by from watching the show that you guys may be younger, but that should not deter anybody from learning the things that you guys are teaching because you guys are very, very well versed in the fishing, the hunting. You know what you're doing. And sometimes that takes, you know, people 52 years or so <laughs> to actually learn this stuff, right? So... Um, tell us a little about uh, your latest trip. I think you were in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan fishing for, uh, was it rainbows, uh, brook trout, and uh, you got a surprise fish too. Tell us about that one. Yeah, so we were, um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan has a lot of cool landmarks, and the show that is going to be coming to you guys here soon 
we've really tried to encompass different cultures, different areas, different landmarks, and kind of give that history type exploration aspect of mm -hmm. the show, in addition to just going out and shooting something. And uh, so when we were up there brook trout fishing, we went and visited Kitchity Kippy, which is a, a natural spring. Um, and it's a, right. it's a tourist attraction in the UP. The most crystal clear blue water you ever saw in your life. Uh, we went cliff jumping off of a place called Black Rocks and uh, near Marquette. And then we also did um, Pictured Rocks, which is super well known. People travel from all over the world to see it. These right. beautiful cliffs come out of the water. Uh, we went and visited those, and then <clears throat> we did some trout fishing. And small river uh, brook trout fishing is my favorite thing to do. I, duck hunting is the only thing that comes close. I've traveled <laughs> all over the world and done all kinds of hunting and fishing. Were you, but to, were you fly but, fishing or spin casting? What, what were you doing? Yeah, I was. We were spin casting, and that was actually part of it too. Is like a lot of people like the idea of getting into fly fishing, as do I. But because our goal is to bring new people into the outdoors. Dumping fly mm -hmm. fishing on them without a guide is is tough. So I was showing them true. how to how to use uh, you know spin casting reels and how to do it effectively. We're just using number one spinners, and uh, also another thing we use is like one sixteenth ounce tungsten jigs tipped with uh, mm -hmm. one inch gold minnows, and mm -hmm. uh, um, to teach people a couple different tactics they could do outside of fly fishing. It's like our goal is always. If everybody's doing something, we're trying to do the opposite. <laughs> in that, that in that case, that's, that's that's what we did. But we caught a ton of fish, and um, we caught a bunch of uh, brook trout. We probably caught over a hundred fish in the two days, and then uh, wow. we got a couple rainbows, a couple bigger ones in the waters that we we're fishing. We we're like small rivers. You know, a brook trout has to be seven inches to keep. Uh, brown trout eight inches, and rainbow trout ten. Um, and we caught plenty of keepers of all of those. Um, nice. So we had tons, tons of fish to eat, which is good. We got to jump to a commercial break, so we're going to leave everybody with a cliffhanger for this other fish you caught that you were not expecting. We'll be right back after this commercial break with Kyle Green from the Greenway Outdoors. <music> All right, back from commercial with Kyle Green from the Greenway Outdoors, if you're just joining us. And Kyle's going to let the cat out of the bag about the fish he caught that probably shouldn't have. <laughs> Kyle, come on, let's yeah. continue the story. So you, you got a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of brookies. You got a whole bunch of legal ones to eat. You guys ate like kings, which, of course, is awesome. Fresh fish right out of the river. There's nothing, nothing that beats it. But this one is cool. Keep going. Nothing I want to hear Nothing cleaner, nothing better. There is a small group of migratory steelhead that come up during the summer uh, in a lot of these rivers. But in the if they're there too long, it can kill them because the water temperature really changes on them. And I was in this hole, and we were, I caught a brook trout out of it. I got into my creel. It was like a 10-incher. And then I'm getting yeah. ready to go again. And I look, and I see a fin above the water. And I'm like, what am I seeing? Like, you glance over it. I'm like, that's a fish fin. So, and then I'm like, yeah, it is, because it's kind of moving and this and that. So I'm trying to yep. cast right in front of it. My buddies tried with MEPS, and he wouldn't bite. So I put the gulp minnow, and I was bouncing it, because it's a jig head, like, right in front of it, and it just kind of yep, lazily yep. grabbed it. I set the hook, and I was using six-pound test in an ultralight, and that made things interesting fast. So he took I off. I'm literally chasing him around the river so he wouldn't break me off, trying to keep him out of this and keep him out of that. Probably the dumbest looking stuff you've ever seen. We ended up getting him, and Jeff's trying to get him in the net, but the net is a trout fishing net this big. The fish was yeah, 27 yeah. and a half inches. Um, Holy smokes. Yeah, he was, he was a beast. So we ended up getting him up, and uh, long story short, <clears throat> once we have him, his head was a really good size, but his body had slimmed out. One of his eyes was kind of glazed over. He looked rough, um, and my, my hypothesis is the reason why he looked rough was because of getting into the river, got too warm, and then he had he, it just it was killing him. So over time, we ended up we ended up letting him go because I was unsure of the regulations, and I was unsure if my hypothesis was right, and I didn't want to eat him. So um, we ended up letting him go, and he went on his way. But it was a really cool bonus fish, and obviously made for some real cool uh, TikTok reels and that sort of thing. 
No, I bet, I bet. So real quick, let's talk about rainbow trout here. Because uh, I know in Western Canada, and uh, we have a ton of rainbows. We've got lakes, rivers, streams that hold them. Uh, there's some massive ones caught in, in Western Canada every year. What's your go-to lure for rainbows? So I, I've done a couple different tactics that I really like. Um, if I'm in bigger water and it's spawning season, uh, for instance, I was in Idaho. I was in Idaho and we did the Snake River. Uh, one of the things I, that that worked real well was a, a plastic bead um, with a with a bobber, and we were sight fishing them, and we could see where they were on their beds, and we would cast above them and let that bead drift right through. Um, right through where they were and you'd see them take it and I'd set the hook that way. That was really fun. And I like bobber fishing a whole bunch. I always have since I was a kid. And when you go to sleep at night, my dad always talked about you go to sleep at night and you close your eyes and you still see the bobber doing its thing like in your vision yep. you know, for, the, for the rest of your nights like burned in your head. And then obviously my go-to in small river stuff is a number one mess. Um, I like silver and I like gold. I'll use bronze mm -hmm. if they got it. But I pretty much just use silver, gold, and uh, that's it. Just plain old number one map spinners with an ultralight. I've gotten really good at strategically casting with that. I know mm -hmm. you know working the water can be tough, but that's 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 kind of my go-to. Or last but not least, depending on the size rainbow trout in the waters, if it's big water, I'll use um, you know one sixteenth ounce jig with like a two and a half inch gulp minnow with a nice mm -hmm. long extended hook and I'll thread it on there. So the, the jig head almost looks like the head of the minnow and then the body comes off the back and the hook kind of comes out of the back of it. Right. Um, I'll use that and in, for those, you kind of cast into the holes and you let, it, uh, you let it sink for a second and then you can kind of bounce that. That's nice for wary older fish because you can hold it in the hole longer. Right. Um, you know, and that, sometimes that'll interrogate a strike. Cool. You know, it's really awesome to watch a young young man like like Kyle here get started in the industry, succeed in the industry, and take things to the next level. This next uh, announcement from Kyle and his team is is a big one. And you know, Kyle, like I said, I, I've followed you it's obviously since you started airing with us, since you started the show, and over the years, it's gotten better and better and better. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to let our viewers know what Wild TV has coming this year in October from the Greenway Outdoors. Yeah, so we, uh, we signed a big announcement, a big deal with the outdoor block of the History Channel. So shows like Swamp People, Mountain Men, Duck Dynasty alone, that grouping of shows, there's gonna be a new show coming to that block and it's obviously the Greenway Outdoors. We're doing a 10 episode series. We're hunting buffalo, we're hunting python, we're in the Everglades, we're trout fishing in Northern Michigan and pretty much everything in between. And uh, we're doing a moose episode too in Maine. And the, the, those mm -hmm. episodes are all gonna air on History Channel and also Wild TV in October. They're high adventure, high octane, but higher production quality. You can expect to see movie theater level quality out of our content. And it's gonna be a big thing for Wild TV and us. Awesome. Well, I'm sure our viewers and, of course, everyone at Wild TV is looking forward to seeing the brand new season of the Greenway Outdoors. we got to wrap it up. We're out of time, Kyle, but thank you so much for joining us, sharing uh, your favorite lures and your favorite uh, way to fish for rainbow trout and rivers and standing water. Man, we're real proud of you. Congratulations. And can't wait to have you back on the show here sometime, probably in September, to start talking about velvet whitetails, moose, and with the hunting season coming up. So thank you again, and we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Hello there, and welcome back to Wild Talk. I'm Kate Rundle, here to present an all-new segment featuring bizarre moments captured while out on the water. For this week's episode, we fished around for some funny and wicked moments to show you in three, two, one.
on, fishy, come on, fishy, come on, fishy, come on, fishy. This chick the f***ing bait. Stop, stop, go, see if it bites again. <laughs> you got one? <laughs> you never know what kind of footage you could reel in when angling. If you have any moments caught on camera of crazy animals in the wild, Fire them over to us at wildtalk at wildtv.ca or slide into our DMs. Your content could end up on future episodes of Wild Talk. Until then, stay wild, friends. Hey, Dad, I found the coolest website. It's called Trap Record, and it's all about hunting, fishing, and outdoor supplies. Really? Tell me more about it, buddy. Trap Record is this amazing store located just off Highway 43 near DeBolt, Alberta. They have everything you could ever need for your outdoor adventures, especially fishing. That sounds awesome. What kind of fishing gear do they have? They've got baits, hooks, swivels, sinkers, you name it. They have it. And oh, you've got to see this. Trapper Gord has the toughest ugly stick tool knife. It's specifically designed for anglers like us, with non-slip handles for better control in any condition. And the metal is super rugged. Sounds like the perfect tool. I always wanted a reliable fishing knife. But wait, there's more. They also have the Flex Filet Knife. It's perfect for you, Dad. It has a flex in their blade just how you like your knives. It's excellent for filleting fishes of all sizes, and the handle is designed with a one-of-a-kind, no-slip grip for total knife control. So maybe you won't cut your hand like last year. Wow, that would come in handy during our fishing trips. Definitely. And you know what else? Trapper Gord has a massive inventory, and everything is usually in stock, so we shouldn't have to worry about finding the right gear when we need it. That's fantastic news. We should plan our next fishing trip soon and visit Trapper Gord to gear up. Yes, I can't wait to go shopping and find all the awesome fishing gear. I'll definitely catch a big one now. All right, Sport. Let's check out Trapper Gord Homestead and Survival together and make our fishing trips even better. <laughs> Welcome back to Wild Talk. I'm your host, Scott Sterling, and we have a guest that needs no introduction. Her name is Megan Evans, and she's the executive director of the Alberta Invasive Species Council. Now, you may have remembered Megan from a previous episode when she came on to tell us all about wild boars and what we can do to control them. Lots of really good information. Well, this time we're talking about fish. Before we get into it, how, how have you been? It's been quite a while since we've talked. Good, yeah, doing really well. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for coming back. All right, well, let's talk about the goldfish. So goldfish, they're not supposed to be here. I'm sure anglers are disappointed when they cast their line if they are to catch a goldfish. So they're not supposed to be here. They don't belong in Alberta's water bodies. Um, so goldfish are, of course, an ornamental species. Uh, they've been in North America for a long, long time. And in recent years, they're really starting to pop up literally all over the place, particularly in stormwater ponds and urban areas. And this mm -hmm. is a, a, a major problem because those stormwater ponds are man-made and maybe have low biodiversity, but they're all intended to be connected to natural water bodies in the event of flooding events and, and, and overland flow. So we absolutely do not want goldfish in any of our water bodies here in Alberta. Where in Alberta are you seeing the most concentration of these goldfish that like I, I guess people are what are they just are they flushing them down the toilet are they setting them free because they don't want fish anymore like how are they ending up in the storm ponds well yeah so so they're they're in storm ponds so they tend to be a, a real uh, an urban issue right so they're in these stormwater ponds calgary edmonton lethbridge red deer and, and other places as well but those are some mm -hmm. of the hot spots people are actively dumping live fish so they're taking the bowl they're taking the tank and dumping those live fish the motivation, you know, we think that folks might think it's the right thing to do, that it's, you know, they don't want their pets anymore and they're rehoming, the, you know, that sort of thing. That is not a practice that we want to promote. The flushing thing, most fish are not likely to survive a flushing process. So, or, you know, going through the, the treatment process, et cetera. Yeah. 
there's the, the, the issue and the potential for disease transmission there. So we don't promote flushing of goldfish. We do not pr promote d dumping of goldfish. In fact, it is illegal to, re to release your aquarium plants and pets into the wild. Um, and, and, and that is the main vector by which they're getting there. What do the goldfish do to the ecosystem when they get into it? Well, so they're not designed to be there. So in our natural water bodies, all of the fish, all of the things in the system kind of evolved, co-evolved and adapted together. And there's a delicate balance in all of our native systems. So when you introduce an invasive species like a goldfish, they, they will often have a competitive advantage. So goldfish can survive like really low oxygen levels, kind of crummy water conditions. Um, they can eat almost anything, so they're real mm -hmm. uh, general in their dietary breadth, and, and that allows them to outcompete the native species for food, which is problematic. Um, they can also kind of kick up and, and, and uproot some of the aquatic vegetation, the degrading habitat for native species, and they're prolific reproducers, so they can spawn up to three times per year, and they just kind of go crazy oh, wow. in that regard. They've drained some stormwater ponds and pulled out 40, 50,000 goldfish out of these ponds. So they oh my like crazy. They can survive in our waterways, in our water bodies in Alberta. And once they are there, it is really challenging to remove them because, you know, in a stormwater pond, as you might imagine, uh, we, we can drain them. We can treat them with things like yeah. rotenone because they're, you know, there's not a lot of other things happening in there. But when we have goldfish and other invasive species in our natural water bodies, that is much more problematic. You can't drain the Bow River. You're not going to treat it with rotenone. So our control methods become a lot more limited and, and eradication is really not possible. How does one start to help to reverse the effects of this? Like, how do we, uh, how do we get a handle on them? Obviously, stopping dumping them, yeah. which is a no-brainer. But what in addition to that can we do to assist getting rid of these invasive species or what do you guys do well you hit it on the head prevention preventing invasive species is the single best way to manage them so we want to prevent their introduction and spread uh, so 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 let people know that it is illegal to dump your aquarium plants and pets uh, and other live fish into water bodies that they didn't come from but you know, once they're there, you can angle, you can fish for them. Uh, you know, uh, if you catch them, kill them, uh, sort of thing. Uh, there is some netting uh, that's being done in certain water bodies to try and get rid of some mm -hmm. other fish. But again, these the, these management practices are unlikely to eradicate them. We're, we're very limited in in our options and really prevention. We need to prevent any further introductions. There's over a hundred infestations of goldfish across Alberta. Okay. Every single one of those was entirely avoided. How big do they actually get? <laughs> and why do they lose their orange color when they go into a lake or a storm pond? Well, they get really big. So, you know, goldfish grow to the size of their surroundings, so they stay little in a tank, but they get really big in these, in these bigger water bodies. So we pu pulled them out the size of dinner plates. We've seen them the size of dinner plates. There was koi mm -hmm. fish pu pulled from a city of St. Albert stormwater pond. I think the thing was 16, 17 pounds. So they get really what? large. What? Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we're not That's dealing crazy. with... That's right. So these things are super problematic um, and they lose their coloration because goldfish are actually, they're not, they, they, they are, um, they're selected, are artificially selected from a carp species for and bred for that beautiful, brilliant gold color. And so in the wild, there's all kinds of factors that can impact the coloration. So, you know, temperature, uh, UV light, oxygen, stress, age, all kinds of things so that they kind of revert to their old kind of drab coloration uh, often in the wild. Very interesting. All right, we got to jump to a commercial break here real quick, but when we come back, we're going to be talking about an invasive species of carp that is in Alberta as well. And we're back. Back with Megan Evans from the Alberta Invasive Species Council. The next fish we're going to talk about is the Prussian carp. And from what I understand, there are a number of river watersheds that have been infested with this particular species. And I think it's the, the Bow River, the North Saskatchewan, the Old Man, the Red Deer River, Rosebud River, and the South Saskatchewan River. So. Megan, what's the deal? Where do these things come from? How did they get in there? And again, how do we get them out? How do we help? Prussian carp, uh, Alberta's claim to fame, we're the first location in North America to find Prussian carp. So Alberta was Luck, the first- Lucky us. Lucky us, yeah, <laughs> not, not a great claim to fame. 
uh, initially found in 2006 in the in the Bow River. Uh, more mm -hmm. kind of sleuthing and eDNA research has, has found that the actual introduction was likely closer to 2000 in the Red Deer River. But since then, they've moved uh, throughout, uh, as you said, they're, they're, they're moving, expanding their range in Alberta exponentially, and I think they've been found in Saskatchewan as well. Now, we know that obviously within watersheds that are connected, they can move around, but people, uh, the, the, the occurrence of uh, Prussian carp in the North Saskatchewan watershed was new, and that was recent in the last couple of years, and there was eDNA that was done prior to that that confirmed they were not present. So that is an act that is somebody actively moving this fish from one watershed to another, which is illegal. That is a finable offense up to $100,000 in a year in jail. You are not allowed to do that. You ask, what, what can we do about it? Well, when, when they're in rivers like the North Saskatchewan River and the Red Deer River, we have very limited control options. Uh, there's not a lot right. that we can do. And these Prussian carp are so prolific. They they are like, a, they're just such a really good invasive species. So they breed really fast. They can spawn up to three times per year. They eat all the different kinds of food. They can uh, outcompete the native uh, species for habitat. They also can produce uh, reproduce sexually and asexually. So the female Prussian carp lays eggs they can be activated by the sperm from other some other fish species so they're not actually fertilized really? they just activates the eggs and results in clones all female clones so they have this tremendous reproductive advantage right so we we want to be keeping Prussian carp out and preventing their spread into any other further water bodies and and we really need to get to the bottom of why people are moving them around and and it might be because they want to angle them closer to home we're not really sure but these are really problematic species and again all of these introductions were preventable we don't know how or why the original introduction occurred though so it's still a little bit of a mystery where is the highest density of population of this invasive species right now is it the Red Deer River where they got introduced or is it someplace else in one of the other water other water bodies it's tough to say you know i'm not sure that we have strong population estimates but we do have a couple of different resources to kind of look for, for that information first there's the ed maps website it's called it's edd maps and you can just do a quick mm -hmm. search for prussian carp and it'll pull up all of the publicly reported occurrences so that gives you a pretty good indicator so the red Deer river bow river are well populated when you do that search you know, I've seen photos of uh, Prussian carp in Lake Newell, like piled up kind of on top of each other. So certain times a year when the canals open or do different things, like they're, they're really, right. uh, they're, 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 they can be large populations in those areas. But yeah, the, the Red Deer and the Bow River are probably the, the two biggest hotspots for sure. That's insane. So there's, is there anything else that people can do, anglers can do besides not putting them back in the water if they do catch them? Yeah, if you catch them, kill it. Uh, you, you can't transport them live away from the water body. Again, there's a lot of regulations surrounding that. If you catch a Prussian carp or a gold fish, kill it. And you can report it. So we actually really do want to know uh, what you're okay. seeing on the ground. Snap a photo. That EdMaps uh, app and website that I talked about, that's a great way. You can just uh, report directly through that. Um, we want to know about it, though, absolutely. Again, prevention. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and it never were there truer words in the invasive species world, because once yep. they're in <laughs> these water bodies, we are very limited with, with our control options. We're going to jump on to the next species, and this one's actually really interesting to me, because I didn't actually know there was uh, northern crayfish, or crawfish, however you want to say it, in Alberta until just a few years ago. And uh, that's the one we're talking about next. Where do we find them? How did they get here? How do we get rid of them besides eating them? <laughs> <laughs> well, have you ever caught a northern crayfish? Have you ever come across nope, them? No, I've oh. never come across them, never actually ate one. But if uh, those big crawfish feeds that they have in Louisiana or any indication, I'm thinking that I might need to go get some. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they taste as good. Supposedly, yeah. So, so they're literally everywhere. Um, so we, we think that they're native to a very small watershed in central Alberta, uh, the Beaver Watershed. Okay. But okay. literally, they're you're only really supposed to be there. They're not supposed to be anywhere else. They are literally everywhere else. I was at a school group next to a creek in southern Alberta, and I have my preserved crayfish. And the kids walked down to the creek, and they found live crayfish just in the creek. They are popping up literally everywhere. And we think that the mode of kind of the pathway of spread and introduction for these crayfish is people actively moving them around because they want to harvest them. So we don't yeah, want okay. people doing that. 
that. Again, these are an invasive species. They can outcompete the native species um, and they cause a lot of problems. Once they get into these water bodies, we're not going to be able to get rid of them. We've got really limited control options. Uh, so we really, it's illegal and we really discourage that practice. Yeah. All right. Well, we got to jump to a commercial here real quick, Megan, and then we'll be right back to continue on the crayfish and or crawfish again, however you want to say it. And uh, we'll be right back. If you're just tuning in to Wild Talk right now, we're actually here with Megan Evans from the Alberta Invasive Species Council, and she's talking to us about different invasive species, gone through goldfish, gone through Prussian carp, and we're on to crayfish or crawfish. Um, talked a little bit about them, Megan, just before the break. Let's jump right back into where we left off. How did they get into the water bodies? I think we covered and you figured that they were being moved by people to be closer to home so they can harvest them, I'm guessing. Again, what can we do to, to help with the problem as, as anglers in, in the province of Alberta? Well, I think, uh, you know, if you, if you catch them, kill them, absolutely. And, and you can't transport them live. Again, with all of these aquatic invasive species, that, that's prohibited. You have to catch them and kill them. Um, I, I think really though, it's an awareness piece and, and crayfish have been around and have been invading Alberta's water bodies for a longer time. So a lot of people aren't aware that they're an invasive species or that there are these regulations surrounding them. So as an angler who cares about the native species that these, these, these invasive species like crayfish might be impacting, help us spread the word and let other people know that uh, these crayfish are invasive, invasive and they're not supposed to be there. I think that's probably the biggest thing that folks could do. Yeah, they've been actually caught in... Uh where right, Banff National Park, they, they're, they're really spreading out, starting to spread out now, right? Um, and you said the fine for transporting a live uh, crayfish is 100,000 plus? I, I think so, yeah. Releasing is 100,000 and or a year in jail. And I think it might be the same for transporting live, yeah. Why are they thriving so well in Alberta? Um, so they're really well uh, suited to, to our environments. They do really well. Um, they're also, uh, you know, they're, they're generalist feeders and that gives them a competitive advantage a lot of the time. So um, they, they, they are breeding rapidly and, and really problematic, you know. So there's northern crayfish that's currently here, present. We don't want it here, but it's all over the place. There's other crayfish right. species that we're also concerned about being introduced possibly through the pet trade. There's a marbled crayfish not present in Alberta, but this is like a non-natural species that kind of popped up in the pet trade in, in the 90s. And this is another species that clones itself. So the reproductive capacity of those species is terrifying. Is it the marble one that clones itself or all species of crayfish? No, just the marbled one. And again, this is this weird species that was kind of produced through the pet trade. We absolutely want to keep that out, but we see them you know, occasionally being sold on Kijiji and stuff like that too. So as anglers, it's in everybody's best interest to make sure th those species stay out of here because they'll be really problematic if they pop up in our waterways. Well, there we go. Goldfish, Prussian carp, Crawfish. Sounds like a really kind of an interesting meal, but uh, <laughs> I don't know about the goldfish part. Megan, is there anything else that you wanted to share with the viewers on uh, the Alberta Invasive, Invasive Species Council um, and how they do things, what they do? You know, how, how can people get involved and help support the, the council? Maybe touch on some of that here for us while we uh, kind of finish off our interview here. Oh, I love it. That's perfect. So, yeah, I, I'd encourage everyone to check out our website. It's abinvasives.ca. Uh, there's all kinds of resources on there. There's an aquatic invasive species pocket guide. Every angler should have a copy of that. You know, helping us spread the word. We all have a responsibility to protect Alberta from the impacts of invasive species. We estimate they're costing us over $2 billion a year right now and impacting wow. our natural resources, like our angling resources. So uh, help us spread the word. Let people know that it's illegal to release your aquarium plants and pets in the wild. It's illegal to release a, a live fish from a water body into one that it, you didn't catch it from. And if you catch an aquatic invasive species, kill it. It's illegal to transport it live. Um, also clean, drain, dry your gear. We have invasive diseases like whirling disease that can be spread uh, through, you know, uh, contaminated gear that was in a contaminated water body. Um, and you can, you can report invasive species using the EDMAPS app as well. And that's a great way that anglers can help us by, by just letting us know when they're finding things that, that aren't supposed to be there. Well, Megan, thank you so much for joining us again. It's a real pleasure as always. 
And hopefully we'll see you on Wild Talk again. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. All right. You take care. Our next guest does not need an introduction. If you know anybody in the fishing tournament circles, Ron Fibke from the Angler Young Angler Tournament. Uh, Ron is the event coordinator for the Calling Lake Northern Alberta events. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, uh, Scott. So I, I heard you had a great turnout and an amazing tournament. Uh, we had one of our uh, one of our team, Ryan Kohler, came up and, and participated in the tournament this year for the first time. Tell us about uh, last weekend and uh, how the tournament went. Yeah, we've been at this for a long time, and uh, it's only getting bigger and better with AYA. And, and it is, AYA, you get what you put in, right? So if you put in a lot of hard work, uh, you get good, great results. So... Mm -hmm. The contestants let you know every year is uh, it's always bigger and better. And I always ask, what can I do? And they're like, what you do is great right now. Sporting goods, fishing stuff, a uh, little bit of electronics. So, yeah, no, it's kind of awesome. It's, it's great feedback we get as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, tell us about, you know, when did, when did Angler Young Angler, these tournaments, uh, when, did they, when did they get started? You know, tell us a little bit more about uh, what happens at these tournaments and uh, kind of give our viewers an idea of if they wanted to come compete in these tournaments, how would they, how would they do that? Sure. So tournaments in a whole is a, a little different than AYA tournaments. So if we focus just on AYA, AYA tournaments happened roughly about 24 mm -hmm. years ago and it started in Ontario. So what they tried to do is they had 10 teams from Alberta okay. and back in the day, this would be a regional event. So the top 10, the winners of the 10 regional events would go into a fish off in Kenora, Ontario uh, for a, uh, actually it was for a trip to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, kind of fell down. Then it went from 10 oh, wow. teams. In, yeah, it went from 10 teams in Canada and then 10 teams in the U.S. So then it became another fish off with the 20 teams. But right. there again, Going to Ontario from, you know, from Ontario, from Alberta, from Saskatchewan, and from the far places in the U.S., people just weren't able to make it to Kenora because the mm -hmm. expense was a little bit too much. So within COVID, uh, they right, kind of, right. yeah, they kind of stopped the uh, the the main event in Kenora, and then we just kept having the regional events. So. To get involved, just a little bit of history with that, it's been in Alberta for just about 20 years. So I believe uh, this is my 12th, 13th year doing AYA, being the event organizer. And I fished it for five years prior to mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. So the contestants were really happy when I actually okay. started putting it on because I won it four on a five times with my two boys. That's right. how I got involved with AYA. So yeah, it kind of just grew from there and uh, getting great sponsors. That was that was the key and getting with the community and uh, getting the community the communities uh, the feedback. So I would go to AGM meetings, for instance, in the Calling Lake area, let them know that hey, we're not here mm -hmm. to hurt the lake. It's all recreational catch and release. So that was kind of their biggest focus. Is yeah, we're going to come and kill their fish. We have to jump to a quick commercial break. But we'll be right back with uh, Ron Fibke from Angler Young Angler and uh, some more information about those folks and a little recap about uh, the fishing tournament that was held uh, a week or two ago. So we'll be right back. We are back with Ron Fibke, event organizer for the Angler Young Angler tournaments in northern Alberta, specifically Calling Lake area. Um, Ron, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the tournament that you guys held on July the 8th. Um, you guys hold this at the, uh, was it the first, uh, the first weekend after the July long weekend for, for this tournament? And uh, tell, me, tell me about the tournament. What, what happened here on the July the 8th? 
so just kind of give you a quick breakdown of it. Uh, we had a great, uh, we had great weather. Uh, what we do is we help load and unload everybody's boat. So it just makes it easier for the parent with the two young uh, children that are in the boat. So yeah, we get them off. They blast off at eight mm -hmm. o'clock, eight thirty. They blast off, and they're in, they're in search of three fish. So two have to be slot and one over. So once they get their three fish in the boat, uh, they can come and get it weighed in and uh, fish all day for that elusive big fish over fifty five as well. So kind of what you a little bit of strategy and just talking to the competitors. I would always get those slots into play the two slots yeah. and they were between 45 and 55 get as close to 55 yep. and then once you get that one fish that one that's over 55 it has to be put in your live well once it's in there you got to come and weigh it in so that's kind of the strategy there then after that it's uh get off the lake and uh come for a good barbecue and then presentations and give away all the cool prizes quickly touch on how sponsors potential sponsors can get involved to sponsor the event, provide prizes, um, you know, gear, that kind of thing for, for all the, the young folks that are participating in the tournament? So this is kind of what AYA is all about. It, it, it takes people like Wild TV and all the great sponsors that we currently have right now at the present time to make this event even possible because all of this is through donation and sponsorship, the prizes. Sure, there's a little bit of an entry fee of $200, but right. that just basically pays for the barbecue and uh, a few prizes because you got to remember, too, first place is a boat, motor, and trailer. Yeah. So that's what they're getting. So not only top of that is all the wow. prizes are pretty well equal throughout the 70 prizes. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of a special and a unique experience when it comes to this type of event. Absolutely. And the kids certainly benefit a ton from it. So amazing. Now, if I was uh, if I was a, a, a team that wanted to come in and compete, how would I how would I register in the in the angler young angler calling late tournament? So right now at the present time, we kind of have like a grandfathered list so this is where it's really hard to get in so we have 70 teams right now so what i usually do is the past 70 teams i give them the first right to refuse so i send them to email sometime in february they have right. a couple of days or a week to respond and then after that i open it up to the public but this year 70 teams responded mm -hmm. i was full in two hours okay. once i advertised it so it's tough it's tough well, I'm certainly very, very happy, Ron, to see the success you guys are, are having with Angler Young Angler here in Alberta and across the country. And of course, um, from every one of us at Wild TV, uh, we're proud to support you guys and be involved. So guys, if you want to sponsor the event and get involved in the Angler Young Angler, uh, even just to compete in, in this great event, be sure to email Ron at Ron Fibke, that's R-O-N, F I B is in Bob K E at gmail.com. Ron, thanks again for joining us. You've been a great guest and I can't wait for next year. Great. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for joining us today and watching this week's episode without you guys, we wouldn't have a show. So thank you so much for watching. Um, be sure to check out Kyle green from the greenway outdoors You know, reach out to him, tell him you saw him on wild talk. A uh, big shout out to Megan Evans from the Alberta Invasive Species Council. Her and her team do amazing work with this type of thing here in Alberta. So make sure you check out their website as well. And of course, a huge shout out to uh, Ron Fibke from the Angler Young Angler Tournaments in Northern Alberta. Uh, again, I'll say if you guys want to get involved, it's a great event and does so much for the kids. Um, Ron Fibke, R-O-N-F-I-B-K-E at gmail.com. And guys, if you have any amazing footage that you shot out in the field and you want to be part of our next social segment, don't forget to uh, email us or slide into our DMs on Insta or Facebook and you may be featured on a future episode of Wild Talk. So can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gores. The Wild TV Canada app. And these fine sponsors.